Okay, so welcome to our tail tutorials on 2015, Croc 1 2015 booklet, the third tutorial, third tutorial, so part three. All right, so let us begin right away. So we have an angiocardiography of a 60-year-old man revealed a constriction of the vessel that is located in the left coronary sulcus of his heart. Name this pathological vessel. Name this pathological vessel. This one, you just need an anatomy or an atlas to be able to know exactly what I am talking about or what they are talking about. So basically, they are analyzing the vessels on the heart. Okay, and they saw one vessel that was constricted. Okay, that was found on the left coronary sulcus. That is like a groove. Okay, it's like a groove of his heart. And they are saying, that what vessel is it? And the name of that vessel is the Ramos circumflex. Ramos circumflex, also known as the circumflex coronary artery. Circumflex coronary artery and it is a branch of the left anterior descending artery it is a branch of the left anterior descending artery which runs within the left coronary sulcus so even though i've divorced for stina but i went treat for stina to just go and google and then get a picture and put it on inside the group page on the telegram so I've divorced you, but still, I have to give you what to do as a way of punishment. Okay. Good. So please <laughs> put it there for us in the telegram. All right. So let's continue. So here your answer is C, Ramos circumflex. Ramos circumflex. A patient complains of a pain in the right lateral abdomen. The right lateral abdomen. So first of all, where is your right side? Good. So the lateral abdomen, that is what they're talking about. Now, palpation revealed a dense, immobile, tumor-like formation. The tumor is likely to be found in the following part of the digestive tube. So since they're talking more of the colon, let us, you know, take anatomically look at the types. I mean, yeah, the types and the sections of the colon. Okay. So usually this is how your colon is. Okay. Ah, for this one, I can draw. <laughs> so this is how it is. Okay. Then, of course, it comes this way. Then you have your rectum here. So this is how it is like. Now, what are we talking about over here? Now, look at it. This is your colon, okay? And with your colon, now, don't forget that this is your, what you call, now, over here, we have the, Secum, okay. Over here we have the secum. Mm -hmm. So, and the appendix, they are all around this area. Your appendix and the secum is around this area. So we have the appendix and the secum. We have the, so this part is going up. So we call it what? The ascending colon. The ascending colon or colon ascendus. Over here is the transverse. Over here is the descending over here is the sigmoid. So anatomically, this is your what? Your colon or your, the different types or the different sections of the colon. So now they are telling you that there's a problem on the right side of the old abdomen. Where do you look out for? Is it here or here? Of course, here. If you look at your stomach, this, I mean your abdomen, this is your what? Your right side. Okay. So definitely they are what? Looking at what? This part, that is what? The colon ascendus. The colon ascendus. Colon ascendus. So over here, we are looking at what? At A. Now, if they have talked about the umbilical area or let's say above the umbilicus, something like that, you might be thinking of what? The transverse. If they have said the left lateral abdomen, you could be thinking of what? That. If they have said uh, the right iliac area, the right iliac area, then you could be thinking of what? The appendix or the cecum. If they are said the left iliac area, you could be thinking of what? The sigmoid. So you see how 
dynamic this whole thing is. So if you understand it, it's always what helpful. Again, if you can check out and look out for the diagram for yourself too, it will make more sense to you. But technically, this is what it is, or this is how it is. So here we're looking at A. Now, during a regular checkup, a child is detected with interrupted mineralization of the bones. Now, when we talk about mineralization, it's more or less like uh, bone formation, isn't it? Bone formation. Now, you and I know that for bone to be formed or for, you know, bone to be well developed, you need what? You need calcium. You need what? Calcium. And by saying calcium, we are talking about which kind of vitamin? Who can tell me? Which kind of vitamin produces calcium or help us with calcium? Who can tell me? Calciferol. 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 Vitamin D. Vitamin D, isn't it? Vitamin D. But in active form, please, you can now mute your microphone. You can now mute your microphone. Good. So now we have what? Basically, the active form supposed to be what? The vitamin what? D. Supposed to be the vitamin D. But of course, the inactive form or, you know, as it begins to grow, we have the, uh, the calciferol, the echo calciferol, and all of these things. So we are definitely looking at what? Vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency. So over here, we are looking at what? Vitamin D deficiency. So the answer is what is B, calciferol, which is, of course, part of uh, vitamin D production. So if that is deficient, it means that... And what disease can this be called? This can be called what? Rickets. So the name of the disease is called what? Rickets. 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 All right. During histological analysis of the lymph node situated in the posterior neck triangle, an 18-year-old patient, a morphologist detected a cluster of cells, including the following. Guys, this is your clue. Isolated multinucleate red stem back cells. Red stem back cells is classic for what? For Hodgkin's disease. Classic for Hodgkin's disease. Classic. And over here, they told you that they have what? Small Hodgkin cells and numerous lymphocytes associated plasma isinophils. What disease has developed? So talking about what Hodgkin cells or Hodgkin's lymphocyte or Hodgkin's yeah Hodgkin's disease, it is the same as what talking about what lymphogranulomatosis, lymphogranulomatosis. And I remember I took some time out to mention some granulomatous diseases and their specifics. For example, when we talk about rhinoscleroma, uh, rhinoscleroma, you know what to look out for. That's the mucolic cells, if you, if you can remember. When we talk about syphilis, you are thinking of all the guma cells. We talk about all of these things. And again, when you talk about Restenbeck cells or Hodgkin cells, we are definitely looking out for what? Lymphogranulomatosis. So for those of you who don't know much about these granulomatous cells, please do well to watch our videos on Pathomorphology. Pathomorphology. You will see all of them there. All right. So you hear your answer is E. An infant has a pyelospasm, weakness, hypodynamia, convulsion as a result of frequent vomiting. What kind of acid based disbalance is it? Now, I've talked to you guys about. Uh, electrolyte imbalances or acidosis and alkalosis. Now, when there's too much of HCl or hydrogen ions, we call it what? Acidosis. When there's too much of hydroxide ions, we call it what? Alkalosis. Alkalosis. Now, this is what I do to help me to remember whether I'm talking about alkalosis or acidosis. Now, imagine you are vomiting. How does your tank become? Who can tell me when you begin to vomit or when things come out of your mouth? How is the taste in your mouth? Who can tell me? Bitter. It's bitter. bitter. Now bitter. that bitterness, good. That bitterness is a sign that you are vomiting what acid out. Now, if you are vomiting acid out, what it means is that the acid level in your in your stomach 
would be would be decreased or increased? Who can tell decrease. me? Decrease. It will be decreased. I'm already saying so there's no point. Good. It will be what? It will be decreased. So when acidosis is decreased, it means we're having what? Alkalosis. 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 And the opposite is true for diarrhea. Now, in diarrhea, you are bringing more of what? Of, of, of alkaline solution. So you're going to have what? Acidosis. So please take note. One thing is that if it is vomiting, just know that because you are having that bitter taste, it's acid. So inside the cell, we are going to have what? Alkaline. And so therefore, we're having what? Alkalosis. And the opposite is true for acidosis when it comes to what? Diarrhea. So please take note of that. And then again, talking about whether it is excretory, gaseous, or whatever it is. Now look at it. You are vomiting. Vomiting is a way of what? Excretion. 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 Although sometimes it can go with what? Metabolism. Or metabolic. Sometimes it can go with metabolic. So in some questions where there's no excretion, but there's metabolic, we can still go for it. But in cases where we have both metabolic and excretion, excretion will take preeminence or will be more profound than the other one. So please, so over here, definitely, you are thinking of what? Excretory alkalosis. Excretory alkalosis. So here, your answer is what? Is E. Excretory alkalosis. All right. Again, I've talked a lot about acidosis and alkalosis in terms of hyperventilation, in terms of hypoventilation, because they are all, that's why we have the gaseous and then the non-gaseous one. So please, I've talked about all of these things. So please, do well to watch some of these videos and trust me, it's going to help. A 39-year-old man who had been operated for the stomach ulcer died seven, seven days after the surgery. So this person was having what? Stomach ulcer. However, the person was, has died. Autopsy revealed that the peritoneal leaves were dull, plectoric, covered with a massive yellowish greenish films. The peritoneal cavity contained about 300 mils of thick yellow greenish liquid. What pathologic process was revealed in the peritoneal cavity? Now, for example, when you tell you that we are having a yellowish green films or sputum or liquid coming out of it. It's a sign that there is what? There is a either, a, there's a, this is a sign of what? A past formation. Okay? It's a sign of what? A past formation. Past can also be described as what? As a superlative or a prurient. Uh -huh. So then you see prurient, you see superlative. They all mean past formation. Okay? They all mean past formation. But of course, the reason for this person dying is the fact that this person developed what we call peritonitis. Peritonitis. And I've discussed with you guys in one of our lectures, either past physio or past morph, that one of the complications of ulcer, okay, let me just ask you guys, we have three complications of ulcers, okay? Three major ones. We can talk about what? About hemorrhage. We can talk about what? About perforation and what? Penetration. These are the three basic, uh, how do you call it, complications of ulcer. And perforation is very, very common. Perforation, meaning that there's what? Peritonitis. Uh -huh. So that can lead to death. Okay. The abdomen or is inflamed or it is infectious or it becomes what? Infected. Or it's going with inflammation. So every part of the abdomen becomes painful when you touch it. So that's what we're having in this what? Patient. So over here, we are definitely looking out for what? For the fact that there's a, a superlative type of peritonitis, we're definitely looking at A as our best option. A as our best what? Option. So over here, we are looking at what? At A. Fibrinous superlative peritonitis. Superative peritonitis. Now when we talk about serous, serous means that the color is clear. Uh -huh. So that means that the fluid is clear. But over here, the fluid or the liquid is not clear. It is what? Yellowish green, which is more or less like what? A pass formation. Uh -huh. So your answer is A. 
And monoamide oxidase inhibitors were widely used as, as a pharmacological drugs. They, they changed the level of nearly all neurotransmitters in the synapses, with the following neurotransmitter being the exception. With the following neurotransmitters being the exception. What it means is that which one of these is not affected by mono, monoamide oxidase inhibitors? That's what it means. And again, let me just throw more light on this. Now, mono, uh, monoamide oxidases, basically, or inhibitors, these are medications that are used to treat uh, depressions, okay? It is used to treat depression. It is used to treat depression. And their hormones include, or the hormones it controls, it, they include dopamine, if I will write it down, dopamine, serotonin, no adrenaline, Adrenaline, histamine. These are the substances that monoamide oxidases affect or they produce. In other words, this, all of them are all more of what? Catecholamines or catecholamines. Catecholamines. Epinephrine, no epinephrine, adrenaline, no adrenaline, histamine, serotonin, dopamine. All of these are controlled or in a way they are produced with the help of what? Monoamide oxidases. So if you're inhibiting them, that means those ones will be what? Will be affected. And which one of them will be exception? Of course, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. So over here, acetylcholine will be the exception or will be exempted from the effect of uh, monoamide oxidase inhibitors. A patient with urolithiasis has developed a severe pain in attacks. For pain shock prevention, he was administered an antispasmodic narcotic analgesic and along with atrophine. Name this drug. Guys, can you remember when we talked about some pain reliefs, about somebody who was supposed to do the teeth and things like that? What do we talk about morphine and promedol? Can you remember? I believe I can remember. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 So morphine is there. However, the drug of choice that we normally go in for is what? It's promedol. Promedol because it has this antispasmodic what effect. It has this antispasmodic effect. And I explained it the last time that yes, morphine is extremely high, but the drug of choice is what? Promedol. However, when promedol is ineffective, we might consider morphine as the next option. But that is not the first line of uh, analgesic or pain relief because it is very, 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 very uh, addictive. You can become so, so addicted to it. You can abuse it easily. So over here, your answer is what? Your answer is A. A patient with acute myocardial infarction has been administered with what? Heparin as a part of a complex therapy. Heparin. Now, okay, sometime later, sometime after heparin injection, the patient developed hematuria. That means bleeding, bleeding, I mean, blood in urine. What heparin antagonist should be injected to remove the complication? To remove the complication. So first of all, you must understand that uh, we are definitely going to uh, prevent, so of course, when there's bleeding, it means there's what? Anticoagulation present. And actually, heparin is anticoagulant. It's what is anticoagulant. That means it prevents coagulation. It prevents clotting. That is what heparin does. It prevents what? Clotting. So if it prevents clotting, it means that you can easily bleed. So if you continue to use heparin, 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 you might end up having what? A bleeding disorder. Because it is anti coagulant, anticoagulant. Okay, so now what drug can we give to prevent this uh, anticoagulant activity of the heparin? And over here, we are definitely going to uh, look out for, for protamine sulfate. Protamine sulfate. And protamine sulfate antagonizes the anticoagulant effect of the heparin. Basically, that is what, what it does. 
That is what it does. It prevents it from happening. And that's what over here we are going in for the uh, protamine sulfate. Protamine sulfate. You, some of all of you know what uh, Vicasol is and stuff like that. So I don't bother myself and go into details about them. But please do well to watch the videos. This is found in pharmacology, I think. All right. A 37 year old woman complains of headache, vertigo, troubled sleep, numbness of the limbs. For the last six years, she has been working at a gas discharge lamp producing factory in a lead processing shop. Lead processing with shop. Blood tests revealed low hemoglobin and RBCs. Serum ion exceeds the norm by several times. Specify the type of anemia. So definitely by virtue of the history being a, a shop attendant, I mean, a lead processing shop or being in a lead processing shop for a very long time because for six good years, that's what he has been working, isn't it? So that means that this person could be having what to call lead poisoning. Lead poisoning. Lead poisoning. And by virtue of uh, lead poisoning, uh, one thing that it can happen is that it inhibits or lead inhibit ferro ferrochilactase. 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 This is an enzyme. Ferro. F E R R O. C H E L A T L A O oh. T A S E Ferrochilactase 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 These inhibit what these I mean the lead inhibit these enzymes these enzymes there's another enzyme called delta amino evolenic acid dehydratase but I don't want to go into details. But these enzymes are involved in the biosynthesis of HEM. And you know HEM is a cofactor that is found in hemoglobin. It's a cofactor found in hemoglobin. So if these things are inhibited, what it means is that hemoglobin will be low. Because what is needed to activate it or to make it function properly is being inhibited by the presence of these what lead substances. And so, therefore, this patient develops what we call ion refractory anemia. Ion refractory anemia. And this results from the disorder of ion inclusion in the hem. Why? Because of their inability to bind due to this ferrochilactase deficiency because of the lead. So there are two different things from iron deficiency anemia. In iron deficiency anemia, of course, there also be what? Uh, low hemoglobin and stuff like that. But the mechanism of action or the pathogenesis is definitely what? Different. And again, too, you, you, you might be seeing of the person not eating properly and stuff like that and things like that. And over here, the problem is not that iron is not there. Iron is there but they are not being utilized. Look at it. It says serum ion concentration exceeds the norm. That's true that iron is there. Iron is not a problem. Iron is there, but it is not being what? Utilized. And we call it what? Iron refractory anemia. Now, in iron deficiency anemia, the serum ion is not even there. I mean, it is reduced than the norm. But over here, it is more than the norm. That means that there are plenty but they're not getting what utilized. And so therefore, your answer here is what? Is uh, iron refractory anemia. So your answer is C. Now, despite the administration of cardiotonics and a thiazide diuretic, a patient with a chronic heart failure has persistent edemas and the risk of ascites arose what medication should be administered to enhance the diuretic effect of the uh, administered what drug? What should we give to help this patient? Guys, look at it. They said, despite 
despite we have been gi- we are giving what a tie that and i think either o- o2 or uh one of you asked a question about uh tie side i don't know whether it's you or not but then one of you answered the last question i mean the last present the last two presentation or so now good now this person have been giving what the tie and we know the tie side will make the person what urinate and so therefore it's going to reduce the pressure in the body in the body we're going to reduce the volume in the body because the reason why we're having the edemas and the ascites is because there's too much of too much fluid inside the body oh there's too much what fluid inside the body and when there's too much fluid inside the body you want to drain them out and usually what we normally use is the thyroid and the fluoresemide is a type of what a thyroid that's what normally used but they are saying that despite the administration of these diuretics and cardiotonics the patient is still having the persistent edema and in the ascites and stuff like that so what else should we give to enhance the diuretic effect and that's where over here your uh, potassium sparring will come in that is what uh, spironolactone spironolactone that is where it comes to play that is when it comes to play so don't go and use for a semen because already it's a form of what a thyroid so don't go and give again all right so over here we are looking at what at d as our option now a monitor is used for people with the brain injury with a risk of maybe inflammation in the brain so we give monitor to reduce the pressure inside the brain all right acute renal impairment cause death of a patient with hemorrhage acute renal impairment okay led to death of a patient with hemorrhage that's bleeding autopsy revealed enlarged kidneys autopsy revealed enlarged kidneys with broad pale pink cortical layer expressively demarcated from dark red renal pyramid macroscopic examination revealed lack of epithelial nuclei of convoluted tubules tuberexis phlebostasis the cell nuclei nuclei of correct glomus and straight tubules were present what pathology are they talking about what pathology are they referring to over here now everything is actually in your question from the macroscopic what examination this is where your answer comes in there's what epithelial nuclei of convoluted tubules tubular uh, tuberexis phlebostasis all of these things is classified what to call acute tubular necrosis acute tubular necrosis don't forget necrosis simply means what there's inadequate supply of what blood to that what tissue so as a result, as a result it's not going what necrosis it's not going what necrosis and that can also be expressed over here there's a dark red right now what pyramid dark color usually the crosses are usually come with what dark color and things like that isn't it so over here we're looking at what acute tubular necrosis acute tubular converted tubules tubular hexes phlebostasis all of these are telling that we are having what acute tubular necrosis and this is also called necronephrosis necronephrosis now if you say infection infection is more used when it has to do with a problem with the heart so myocardial infarction meaning there's what necrosis aha uh-huh. so over here we're looking at what necronephrosis 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 all right a 3 year old child with a meningeal symptoms died meningeal symptoms died post Postmortem microscopy of the pia mater revealed a miliary nodules nodules which were microscopically presented by a foci of gaseous necrosis gaseous necrosis with masses of epithelioid and the lymphoid cells with large cells containing crescent shaped peripheral nuclei situated between them specify the type of meningitis this child is having now gaseous necrosis is a type of tuberculosis it's a type of what tuberculosis 
a, I mean, a complication of tuberculosis, gaseous necrosis. So over here, we are definitely looking at for what? Tuberculosis type of what? Meningitis. Tuberculosis type of what? Meningitis. Now, in meningococcal type of meningitis, you might be seeing some sort of what? Infection or rashes on a child's body. Aha. Uh -huh. But over here, nothing like that present. So over here, we are definitely going for what? For tuberculosis type of what? Meningitis. So your answer here is E. A six-year-old woman had intravenous injection of magnesium uh, sulfate solution to stop hypertensive crisis. However, her arterial pressure did not decrease. And after repeated introduction of the same preparation, she developed slugginess, slow response to stimulus the patient's unconscious. What preparation is antagonist of magnesium sulfate and can remove the symptoms of it overdose. So you see, obviously they've told you the answer already. I mean, the diagnosis is that there's what? Magnesium sulfate overdose. Because you are given to reduce habitative crisis. It's not working and you are still giving repeated introduction. And now you are having what? The complications <laughs> of it overdose. So the question now is that what drug can prevent this intoxication? And there's no fun in telling, there's no calculation about it. This is simply what? gluconate or calcium gluconate calcium gluconate that's what we use or calcium chloride we use calcium gluconate or calcium chloride so you can write gluconate down just in case you have a question and then there's no calcium chloride your answer should be what calcium gluconate calcium gluconate all right so your answer here is what is a calcium chloride calcium chloride all right now for those who are lovers of chemistry or biochemistry. This is magnesium sulfate. Okay. So this magnesium sulfate, now magnesium sulfate reacts with calcium chloride. Calcium chloride. What do we have here? You are going to have what? Magnesium chloride and what? Calcium sulfate. And that helps a lot. That helps to neutralize the potency or the, 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 the intoxication of this magnesium with sulfate, as simple as A, B, C, D. So that is why we give calcium chloride. All right. A patient working at a pig farm complains of proximal abdominal pain, liquid feces, with mucus and blood, headaches, weakness, and fever. Examination of the large intestine revealed ulcers from one millimeter up to several centimeters in diameter. Feces contained over unicellular organisms with cilia. With cilia. What disease can be suspected? Now, they've given you an information of that, of the fact that this person is a pig farmer. It's a pig what? Farmer. So the question now is that what is this large intestine? We filled a large intestine with ulcers. This is specific for what we call balantidium coli. Balantidium coli. Balantidium coli. And these are ciliated protozoa. Ciliated protozoa. And I think that this, when they analyze the, the egg or the feces, they saw what? Cilia present, and that's that this is what it's a ciliated what protozoa, ciliated what protozoa. And in the history of pig farm, I mean, being a pig farmer, pigs usually are the primary reservoirs from Balantidium coli, primary reservoirs, primary reservoirs. So if you begin to eat an infected, you know, pig and things like that, you can develop something like this. All right, so over here, we're looking at what? Balantidiasis. Balantidiasis. Again, do well to check your, our microbiology uh, presentations. Some of these things, I took my time to explain them. Toxoplasmosis, amoeba, and those kind of things. Lamblia, we discussed them in detail. So please do well to check our videos on microbiology. All right. 
An unconscious patient was delivered by ambulance to the hospital. On examination, the patient was found to present with no reflexes. No reflexes. Periodical convulsions, irregular breathing. After lab examination, the patient was diagnosed with hepatic coma. Now, what is one, what is one of the main functions of the liver? Who can tell me? What is the main function of the liver? Who can tell me? Main function of the liver. Bowel production. Come again. It's a bowel production. Okay, bowel is there. What else? Detoxification. Detoxification. <laughs> yes. Detoxification. That's one of the main functions of the of, of your liver. Detoxification. Now they are saying that disorders of the following ne central nervous system develop due to the accumulation of the following metabolites. Now, one of the things that the liver helps to detoxify is what? Ammonia. And the brain doesn't like ammonia for some reasons. <laughs> it hates ammonia like crazy. So anything that you see someone is having hepatic coma, that means the liver is not performing its function by excreting the ammonia in its system. And this can enter into the, what, the brain and become what toxic to the brain. And when it becomes toxic to the brain, of course, it means that this ammonia is taking place. And sometimes when you smell the breath, you, you, you begin to perceive that kind of what, ammonia gas from the mouth or from the breath, if I should put it that way. Okay, so over here, you are looking at for what? For ammonia. Ammonia. This has disrupted the central nervous system. Another term that they use to describe hepatic coma means hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy, which means an altered level of consciousness as a result of liver failure. As a result of liver failure. So the liver is not able to undergo its normal what processes or normal what mechanisms by removing ammonia from the blood. Now, when playing, a child received a hit to the pre sternum region, the pre sternum region, the pre sternum region. As a result of this trauma, an organ located behind the pre sternum was damaged. Name this organ. So this one. It's just your anatomy. So your sternum, just put your hands on your sternum, your, your chest, the middle part of your chest, left and right, the middle part, that is your, what, your sternum. So what structure is behind the sternum? Don't go and say esophagus. Yes, I know esophagus is there, but <laughs> what organ can you also locate over there? And of course, you are looking at what? The thymus, the thymus, the thymus, the thymus. So over here, your answer is what? The thymus. The thymus. All right. A child suffers from dry cough. What non-narcotic antitussive drug will relieve the patient's condition? What antitussive drug? Non-narcotic antitussive drug. And over here, you are looking at what? Glaucine. Glaucine. Glaucine, glaucine, and this is the only centrally acting antitussive. When we say antitussive, it means anti cough. Antitussive means anti cough. So, this is the only centrally acting antitussive drug, and at the same time, non narcotic or non opioid. It is non opioid, non opioid. So, over here, we're going to use what? Glaucine. Glaucine. A patient complains of acute pain attacks in the right lumbar region. If I were you, I'll just put my hands at the lumbar region. During examination, a nephrolytic obturation of the right ureter in the region between the abdomen and the pelvic segment have been detected. Now, when I say nephrolytic, it means stones. Isn't it? Stones in the kidney. And this stones is blocking or is between the abdomen, no, the right ureter, the right what, ureter in the, in the region between the eighth abdominal and the pelvic what, segment. Now, what anatomical boundary exists between those two 
segment, those two segments. There's no fun in telling this. You definitely need an atlas to show that. And like I said, in future, maybe I'll start trying and bringing some diagrams to help us with some of these sort of explanations. But basically, we are looking at the linear terminalis. The linear terminal. This doesn't need an explanation, but it's the linear because it's anatomic <laughs> finding that you have to locate. But this is what the linear terminal is. And this comprises of the, pectili the pectineal line or the pubis. The pubis, it also contains the acute line, the sacral uh, promontory, the superior margin of the pubis, symphysis, and it forms the boundary between the abdominal and the pelvic cavity. So this linear terminalis, that is what it is. So these are the component or what it constitutes. If you had a diagram, it could have what helped us with something like that. But unfortunately, uh, I don't have the diagram to do that. And again, I will call my dear wife to help us with the diagram on the telegram page. So please do that for us, okay? So what you're looking at what? The terminalis. Terminalis. Just type linear terminalis. You will see a diagram on it. All right. Okay. Sure. A patient has insufficient blood supply to the kidney. Insufficient blood supply to the kidney. I think it is this simply that I talked about the macula densa, the renin angiotensin, the RAS system. Am I right? The same place I talk about these things. Now look at it. There's inadequate blood supply to the kidneys, which has caused the development of the pressure effect due to the constriction of the arterial re resistance vessels. This condition results from the vessels being strongly affected by the following substances, by the following substances. So when, when, when there's low blood supply, when there's low blood supply to the kidney, what did I say will be activated? Oh, the RAS system will be what? Activated. The RAS system will be activated. I discussed this thing with you guys. RAS. RAS system will be activated. The RAS system. And how, and how is this RAS system get activated? I told you guys that when, the, when there's low blood supply to the kidneys, what it happens is that the, the, the macular dense that begin to sense that there's no sodium coming around. And when there's no sodium, uh, it gets agitated and it tells the gesta glomerular apparatus, guys, secret renin. Secret renin because we need what? Sugar. Sorry, we need salt or we need urine. Okay, so the renin, uh, uh, so that means low blood supply will now activate the renin. And the renin will catalyze the conversion of what? Angiotensinogen, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Aha. Uh -huh. It converts what? To angiotensin 1. Now, this angiotensin, now there's another enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, which will convert the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And this angiotensin 2 is what causes vessel constriction. And it causes vessel constriction in order to increase blood pressure. To increase what? Blood pressure. It also causes what? Vasopressin release. And also what? Aldosterone increase. And this aldosterone would help in what? The absorption of what? Of sodium. Great. So this is what we call the, the RAS system. But the question is that what is responsible for the constriction of arterial resistance? What is the sort of a constriction of the vessel? What is responsible? And the exact enzyme responsible or the exact substance responsible is the angiotensin 2. Don't forget, Rene will, active, will convert angiotensinogen tensinogen to angiotensin 1. And that angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2, which is needed for the vessel construction. Uh -huh. So the substance exactly 
the substance, the exact substance is what angel turns into. So over here, we're looking at what? At D. At D. Not no epinephrine. All right. In a village, a case of anthrax has been registered. Medical services began epidemiologically indicated specific prophylaxis of population against anthrax. What preparation was used for this purpose? In other words, we want to prevent anthrax infection, just like we are in the era of COVID-19, isn't it? So in the era of COVID-19, what do we need? We need whatever seen the same way in the area of anthrax to prevent the disease from happening or from having effect on the people, you have to offer what? A prophylaxis. And that prophylaxis is what? It's a vaccine. It's a vaccine. It's a vaccine. So you need what? The human anthrax vaccine. The human anthrax vaccine. And the human anthrax vaccine includes a cellular, which is produced in the USA and in the UK. And then we have the life spore, which is produced in Russia. It is produced in Russia. Okay. However, looking at the option that we are having over here, definitely we are going to go in for what? For the life vaccine. Life vaccine. So your answer should be D. Life vaccine. Life vaccine. All right. Experiment, experimental stimulation of sympathetic ne nerve branches. Sympathetic nerve branches. Guys, you remember sympathetic when we're talking about the... Uh, talking about condition and unconditioned sympathetic, right? Exactly. So they said that there's experimental stimulation of the sympathetic nervous branch. And we established that in sympathetic, everything is giddy giddy like you become so hyper. Now the question is, what is causing those hypersensitivity? Or that what is causing those energy to come about? Now let's look at the question. So the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous branch that innervate the heart caused an increase in the force of the heart contraction. Don't forget, in parasympathetic, there's what? A decrease in heart rate. But in sympathetic, there's what? An increase in the heart rate. That's what I mean, when you're getting scared, your heart begins to, to pant, isn't it? I mean, begins to beat, let me use that word. Begins to beat, that means it's contracting faster. <laughs> exactly. So now look, there's an increase in the force of a contraction because the membrane of, because the membrane of typical cardiomyocyte permitted an increase in the following. It permitted an increase in the following. In other words, what helps in contraction? What is needed to help in contraction? Who can tell me? What is needed to help you to ensure yes. contraction? Come again. Calcium. Calcium, not potassium. Calcium. Now, we talk about potassium. Potassium deals with electrical activities. Don't confuse the two. Potassium helps with what? Arrhythmias. In case you have arrhythmias, then calcium, I mean, potassium comes to mind. But in case of contraction, we are dealing with what? Calcium. Calcium, calcium is needed. Calcium is needed. Good. So over here, of course, in terms of excitability, the neurons, yes, you might need what? Potassium. Know that about that. But in case of the contraction, the case here is what? Contraction. Force of heart contraction. And that is why over here, it involves muscles. So over here, your answer is what? Calcium. So it allows calcium to what? To enter. Calcium entry. Calcium entry. In potassium, they have to do it what? Electrical activity. And that is completely different. All right. According to the result of glucose tolerance test, a patient has no disorder of carbohydrate tolerance. Despite that the glucose is detected in the patient's urine, that's five mils per mole, the patient has been diagnosed with renal diabetes. What renal changes cause glucosuria in this case? In this case. So we are having glucose in urine. What does it mean to have glucose in urine? What it means is that 
glucose is not being reabsorbed. Isn't it? It means glucose is not being reabsorbed, so it is found in the urine. But you're not supposed to see glucose. I mean, a lot of glucose in your urine. So for us to have glucose in the urine, it means that the kidney is now very loose that it allows glucose to go out of the body or the cell. Do you know what I mean? It allows them to go out of the... Because glucose, amino acid, and the rest vitamins must be reabsorbed and should not appear in the urine under normal conditions or circumstances. You shouldn't see them in the urine. So for you to see them, it means that the kidney is not performing properly. And that's because there is a decreased activity of glucose reabsorption enzymes. Decreased activity of glucose reabsorption enzyme. So over here, your answer is E. Your answer is E, E, E. All right. Ideolar space of arsenos was invaded by bacteria that interacted with the surfactant. Guys, we talked about what surfactant. Who can tell me the two types of surfactant? Who can tell me? Anyone? Oh, we've talked about this. Surfactant. Two types of surfactant. Who can tell me? We have the type 1 and then the type 2 surfactant or alveolocyte. Alveolocyte. We have the type 1 and then we have what? The type 2 alveolocyte. Don't forget that. But the question is not really, really about that. The question is that there is an invasion. And I think we've did this question before. There's an invasion. Now look at it. This led to the activation of, what, of cells that are localized in the alveolar walls and on the surface. Name these cells. Name these cells. So now, if you have an antigen, I think I, I even drew a diagram about it. So guys, what are you talking about in this question? You have an antigen, which is the bacteria. What substance will attack the bacteria? Definitely macrophages. Macrophage. Yes. Macrophages. 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 So over here, you're talking about macrophages. Macrophages. All right. But we have two types of sites: Type 1 and then type 2. So please go ahead and search the function of type one avulocyte and the type two avulocyte. I've discussed it already with you guys in one of the presentation. So please go ahead and search for it or go ahead and watch the video. So your answer here is what? Macrophages. Parent of a five year old boy reports him to have a frequent cold that developed into pneumonia, presence of purulent rashes on the skin, lab have revealed the following absence, guys, look, absence of immunoglobulins of any type. Absence of immunoglobulins of any type and naked cells are absent from the lymph nodes pontict. What kind of immune disorder is it? What kind of immune disorder is it and over here we are looking at Bruton's aga agama global global globe uh Bruton's what Bruton's agama global linemia hey English is difficult to but it's well <laughs> so please don't laugh if you laugh you're going to pay hundred dollars again now I'm what <laughs> Bruton's <laughs> you are paying hundred dollars <laughs> So we have one. <laughs> All of you are paying hundred dollars. Two people have laughed. So hundred dollars. So that means I'm going to have twenty dollars. So this is what Bruton's disease. This is what Bruton's disease. Bruton's disease. And in Bruton's disease, there is no maturation. And you know that first of all, you know that uh, hemoglobins is I mean are produced or. Uh, Beta and B cells, B cells helps in the production of immunoglobulins. B cells, where we now have the plasma cells, B cells, plasma cells, please, 
B cells. So try and look for them. Try and look for them. We have the what we call B cells. These B cells, don't forget, we have the B cells and then the, the T cells or the B lymphocyte or the T lymphocyte. Don't forget these, these two types. Now, the B cells are responsible for the production of immunoglobulins. That's the IgA, IgB, IgG, IgM, those kind of things. Good. So now in Bluetons, we have that deficiency whereby the cells are not able to mature from pre-B cells to mature B cells, to mature B cells. And again, these are responsible for what? For the production of immunoglobulins, production of immunoglobulins. So how do I remember this? Even though this is X-linked, but B means what? Bruton. B for what? Bruton. B type means Bruton. So if you have this in the back of your mind, you know that B cells are responsible for immunoglobulins. So if they tell you that there's no immunoglobulins present, it means what? B comes to your mind. B comes to your mind. So over here, you are looking at what? At E, Bruton. Don't, don't worry. I'll, in another question, I'll show you another, another thing again. I don't want to rush things for you guys. All right, so yeah, we're talking about the B. Sorry, Bruton. Answer is what E. This is X linked. X linked. All right. Examination of a 42 year old patient revealed a tumor of adenohypophysis. What's another name, another name for adenohypophysis? Who can tell me? I think pituitary. Pituitary. Good. The patient's weight. Now they said there's a, there's a tumor there. Patient's weight is 117. He has moon like hyperemic face. There's strata of the skin, there's tension on his belly. That's like a, a, a stretch marks. Uh -huh. Osteoporosis and muscle dystrophy are present. Arterial pressure is 210, 140. What is the probable what? diagnosis? What is the probable what? diagnosis? Now over here, I know the confusion will be Cushing syndrome and Cushing disease because definitely it's Cushing. My question is, what is the right answer? The right answer is what? Cushing disease. And I'll tell you why. Now, Cushing disease is caused by a pituitary gland tumor. Now, we talk about Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome is simply signs and symptoms of high cortisol level. Please. <laughs> there are two things I've just, I'm just saying over here. I repeat, when there is excess of cortisol level, we are having what's called what? Cushing syndrome. And this excess level could be caused by anything. It could be caused by anything. It could be an infection inside the, or, or yeah, reaction inside the adrenal gland itself or other thing. But if the cool, the, the cortisol level is as a result of a tumor in the brain that is cushion disease. That is cushion disease. Why? Because it will end up secreting a lot of what? ACTH. And this will stimulate the adrenal gland. And I've told you guys which part of the adrenal gland will produce cortisol. I've told you guys, GFR, please. If you can't remember, if you forgot about it, do well to watch the previous video. I talked about it. Please. Good. So please, these are the differences between Cushing disease and Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome are the signs and symptoms associated with excess cortisol level in the body, regardless of the cause. Whilst Cushing disease is a disease or high cortisol level that is caused by tumor in the pituitary gland. I believe I've made myself clear on this one. So your answer here is what is C. Two days after labor, a woman develops shock along with DIC syndrome. DIC syndrome. That caused her death. Caused her death. Now, is it DIC syndrome? In a, I mean, it has to do with what? Uh, coagulation, what? Coagulopathy. Okay. 
disseminated uh, is it intra, uh, intravascular uh, how do you call it coagulopathy something like that syndrome so that means coagulation is impaired or there's a problem with the coagulation that is one it caused her death autopsy revealed prurient endometriosis that means infection is there regional prurient lymphadenitis again infection of the lymphoid L- uh, lymphadenitis is there prurient thrombophebitis is also what there so infection 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 there were also dystrophic alteration and intestinal inflammation of the parenchymal organs what is the most likely diagnosis guys we are talking about a severe form of sep- sepsis or this is sepsis let me put it that way this is what sepsis inflammation 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 this is what sepsis 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 and when we say uh, septicemia septicemia is simply a form of sepsis it's a form of sepsis and usually in this form of sepsis hemorrhagic syndrome is very pronounced hemorrhagic syndrome is very pronounced no one of the person developed what dic syndrome that means inability to control what bleeding inability to control bleeding so everything here is telling us that we have what a septic shock septic shock so over here we are going what septicemia septicemia all right in case of acaptonuria guys you remember when we talk about acaptonuria right the last time we talk about acaptonuria good now you see we talk about hemogentesic acid isn't it we talk about it good now they are saying that in a case of acaptonuria this acid is excreted in urine in large amount the development of this disease is associated with a metabolic disorder of the following amino acid the following amino acid guys now for them to uh excrete a lot of what hemogentesic acid this hemogentesic acid is generated from tyroxine don't forget that we're talking about uh, phenylalanine and tyroxine right but to be specific they are talking about what hemogentesic acid and this is generated from tyroxine it is generated from tyroxine 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 so over here we are looking for what for tyroxine 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 when blood circulation in the damaged tissue is restored blood circulation is restored in the damaged tissue lactate accumulation stops by now i'm sure you guys are familiar with what lactate acid so in lactate acid lactic is formed due to what lack of oxygen for glycolysis to take place or for energy to be produced please we talk about this one and the lactic co- accumulation stops and glucose consumption decelerates you see you know glucose is what is what helps us to produce what energy and then glucose consumption decreases now these metabolic changes are caused by the activation of the following what processes So under what condition even if you don't know under what condition will lactate accumulation stop who can tell me under what condition would lactic as accumulation stop when there is what oxygen error oxygen when there is what oxygen because when there's lack of oxygen lactate will be produced when there's oxygen lactate will, will, will go away another name for oxygen is called what aerobic 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 so that means that the process has been activated over here is what aerobic glycolysis aerobic glycolysis so your answer here is what is d aerobic glycolysis medicine is sweet if you understand it okay it's sweet if you understand it you will not be trying to cram answers no 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 understand it 
A doctor examined a patient, studied blood analysis, and reached a conclusion that peripheral immunogenesis organs are affected. Peripheral immunogenesis organs are affected. What organs are the most likely to be affected? What organs are the most likely to be affected? Now, we talk about immunogenesis. That means what? Immune system or organs of the immune system. Now, organs of the immune system are divided into two groups. If you are writing it down. Organs of the immune system are divided into two groups. We have the central and then we have the peripheral. Central is also called the primary. And with the primary, we have the thymus and then the bone marrow. Write it down. With the central or the primary uh, immune system organs are the thymus, where differentiation of lymphocytes takes place. Then we have the bone marrow, where we have the differentiation of what? Cells. The peripheral ones, also known as the secondary, include lymph nodes, the spleen, the lymphatic tissue of the GIT, and the tonsils. I repeat, the secondary or peripheral organs of immune system include the lymph nodes, the spleen, the lymphatic tissue of the GIT, and the tonsils. So please, what is your answer here? Who can tell me? Tonsils. Tonsils, as simple as A, B, C, D. So your answer is what? Is D. Is D. But if they say, what is the primary uh, organ of the immune system? You're either going for red bone marrow or the thymus, as simple as A, B, C, D.